All right. So it's time for our third panel of the day, Community and Economic Development. So I'm going to turn this over to our ma moderator, Brandy Blessed. Hi, everybody. Hi. I got you after lunch, so I think that may be a good thing. Um, I'd like to introduce our panelists for today. Um, are you folks going to come to the table, or? <laughs> I, I, <laughs> you don't have to. I just want to. <laughs> just quite, Just curious. We wanted to see the presentation. Okay. Oh, that's fine. Um, So first we will have Kathy Newman. She's an associate professor from Rutgers in New Brunswick. Next we have a presentation from Stacy Sutton, who is an assistant professor at the University of Illinois at Chicago. And closing us out would be Daniel Orca. He's a principal from Interboro Partners in New York City. So um, each of the panelists will have about 15 minutes to present, and then I'll open it up to you all for questions. Great. <laughs> Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How's everyone? Let me just get my notes up. So first, I want to just start by thanking Niall for putting this together. Um, and in the spirit of interdisciplinarity, I think uh, you know it's not often, especially as scholars, that we get to kind of spend a day talking across disciplinary boundaries. So um, I want us to take full advantage of that. And I just I want to just start with this kind of funny story and somewhat of a disclaimer. Um, so when I was preparing uh, my talk this week, I started going back to some of the emails that I received from Mia and from uh, Nayo, and I came across, because I was trying to figure out the logistics, like how much time do I have, and so on and so forth. And I came across an email from February 4th sent, uh, from Nayo, in which there were the guidelines, the presenter's guidelines attached to this email, and those guidelines were guidelines from the foundation, right? And the primary component of the guide from Robert Wood Johnson's foundation speaker guidelines are uh, for speaker foundation sponsored events, the speakers are not allowed to do any lobbying. Right? I was like, okay, well, I'm not really lobbying. I mean, what do they mean by that? So then I continued to read. And um, at first sight, I was a little bit concerned, like when, you know, when they said lobbying. And then I, when I read further, I was relieved to see that, they, that panelists are allowed to discuss legislation that's already passed, like, quote, end quote. Right? And then when you continue to read, there's a caveat there. It's like, but please note, however, that your discussion of legislation that's passed in one jurisdiction may be lobbying if you suggest to legislators that that should adopt uh, similar legislation in another jurisdiction, or suggest to members of the public that they can contact their legislators to push for the adoption of similar legislation in their jurisdiction. I was like, well, what am I going to speak about? I mean, like, really, like, Do Dr. Jones, you shouldn't have said any, half of what you said, right, in terms of, like, voting and all of this. And so, again, anything I say, I take full responsibility. This is not keep funding Nayo and the Center for Race and Ethnicity. They, she has no control over it. But I, I thought it was interesting and ironic because as an urban planning professor, you know, and, and fully grounded in the tradition of David, uh, David Off and, and, and Jane Jacobs' uh, advocacy, advocacy planning and Norm Krobenholtz' ev equity planning, this is what we teach our students, right? We teach our students to have these normative visions about the urban, urban futures. We teach our students that, that we have to disrupt, we, that we have to expose propose and politicize. That's what we do on a daily basis. And we use empirical evidence to, to kind of bolster our case, but you have to have this vision. So you have to have understanding and the vision. And so I say all of that, and then I say, anything you hear today, don't do anything with it, right? Just like sit on it, right? <laughs> just don't do anything. Just allow it to you know, like, you just like roll over you. So that was my kind of the intro. So I've been working on this project around gentrification. So I do a lot of work in community economic development, neighborhood change, and, and gentrification is a, is a component of that. Um, and so this is kind of a tentative, the kind of proposed title is New Ontologies of Gentrification and Increasing Significance of Race. And again, as I was preparing this, I was reading some of the history. So history is kind of where I begin a lot of the, my research. And in looking at uh, historian Nathan Connolly's work, a, a, world more, um, a World More Concrete, he says, and I'm going to read this again, uh, many people characterize urban renewal projects and the power of eminent domain as two of the most widely despised and racist tools for reshaping urban, urban cities in the post-world period. Samuel Zapp's piece on uh, Manhattan Projects does a lot of the same, but he's looking at very specific projects that were about centralizing power and capital in Manhattan 
and continuously marginalizing the rest of the city and particularly peoples of color, right? And so there's a, there's a plethora of historians that we could look at and their works uh, that tell us and help us understand uh, the racialization of urban landscapes. And I think there's a general acceptance of these pieces, right? Because they're historical pieces. And we can look at a map like the one on the left, which is a, is a redlining map for Brooklyn. And um, you know, yet again, conventional wisdom, we, we, over time we've come to accept that this was what the Homeowners Loan Corporation did in terms of deciding where we can um, uh, make loans. When you look on to the map on the right, which is in 2006, so 1936 versus 2006, this map is interesting because it speaks to much of what Kathy was talking about. The, the red dots are foreclosures in different processes, but nevertheless foreclosures in Brooklyn. And the brown areas are areas that have at least 50% black population, right? So when you kind of situate these maps, again, I don't have to spell this out for you in terms of how correlated they seem, right? This, isn't, this is just a descriptive, but they seem highly correlated and it speaks to some things that other people were talking about today. Um, so part of the reason I begin with this is because I'm saying, I believe that there's, there's there's been a challenge, in, 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 at least among scholars, talking about gentrification and a resistance to use racial frameworks to understand gentrification, right? That gentrification historically has been defined uh, as a class-based phenomenon, and I'll, I'll define it more explicitly. And, but it's also become kind of the, the lingua franca among urbanists to talk about all neighborhood change. And it's not all neighborhood change. Everything is in gentrification. We have revitalization, we have renew, uh, uh, renewal, we have regeneration and upgrading and so forth. Gentrification is something specific. So what is gentrification? So the classic studies of gentrification characterize it as a social and economic process of neighborhood change that occurs with an influx of upper income, higher status residents into low income urban neighborhoods, uh, which dis uh, dis presumably, and I would say it definitely displaces the original low income residents and changes neighborhood character, right? Um, but few early studies explicate racial, kind of very, you know, explicate the racial dimensions of that. Although there is kind of a tacit understanding that, that the original residents and the lower income residents are kind of racialized bodies, right? They're black and brown people. But there's not a lot of literature, and for a set of reasons, a lot of it has to do with methodological challenges in, in measuring, um, that uh, explain how the kind of assembles of, of policies and practice deployed in these areas uh, have these variegated effects across places and racial bodies. So, so again, we understand these class dimensions, and I have to say that Kathy Newman and her co-authors have done quite a bit of work in pushing that forward and pushing the boundaries because, you know, our, our colleagues were having a difficult time really acknowledging that displacement occurs with gentrification, right? They're like, well, how much does it really occur? Is it something we need to worry about? And Kathy said, well, we need to use mixed methods to get at this, right? So we can't just accept that just because you can't measure it, it must not be there. Um, so for this project, what I did is I started looking at, one, this, this, the conventional way of thinking about gentrification and um, the way what you see in the media, right? So I think we all know experientially that everyone's talking about gentrification. So I started doing just very basic kind of uh, uh, frequency tests of like, where is all this discourse around gentrification coming from? So I, I, I kind of did a count of the New York Times articles between 1975 when it was 79, I think, actually, when it was first, it first emerged in the New York Times uh, through 2014. <clears throat> and what we see in the beginning, there's, a, there's uh, well, in the, this is the beginning, obviously, and we saw, I saw about 200 articles. So these are just capturing all of the articles, and the, um, the orange line is just the percent change. Uh, all of the articles. And so by 2000, the, in five-year period, so between 2010 and 14, there were over 800 articles that were either directly kind of full exposés of gentrified neighborhoods globally, essentially now, uh, or just mentioning of gentrification. And so in a sense, what I was really looking at was, you know, is it true that more people are talking about gentrification? But not only are they talking about it, they're talking about it in racialized terms, right? So when you start reading these articles, not just searching for the number, you start to realize that the language of race is more prominent in the later periods, right? And so titles like, uh, in Harlem, blacks are no longer the majority, right? These really incendiary titles, or a title like um, uh, a striking evolution in Bedford-Stuyvesant as, white, as po white population soars, right? So again, the conventional wisdom and our day-to-day -day experiences understand gentrification through a racial lens. However, scholarship is a little slow, as we know, to catch up. 
uh, to what we know is ex exists. So what I've been trying to do is <clears throat> begin to kind of measure this. So I came up with a metric for gentrification. We can talk about it. I don't have that much time. Uh, but essentially, it's an, indices, an index that looks at change in college education, change in uh, rental units, and change in neighborhood tenure, amount of time people are in the neighborhood uh, as a measure of gentrification. <clears throat> and I use that to test uh, a set of things. And so I look at gentrification between 1970 and 2010 in New York City. And if we were to can just kind of classify this in the 1970s, and I do it at two different scales, and the right uh, map, those are the census tracts, and here these are what we in New York call neighborhood tabulation areas, about 15,000 uh, population. So they're a little larger, and they're attached to a neighborhood name. So it's the, we don't, you know, if you ask someone, what census tract do you live in? Do you know what census tract you live in? Right, like who, who knows that? But that's again, what we use in social science. Uh, nobody really knows what that means, but we know these neighborhoods. We know that uh, when Jane Jacobs was writing about gentrification or the potential of gentrification uh, around urban renewal, she's talking about the West Village. And we know that uh, Neil Smith and others were writing about it the next decade happening, and it was largely in the East Village, right? So these are the neighborhoods in which we have attachment. We understand those geographies. At five minutes, wow. How could you have 10 slides? I only had 10 slides, right? Like, so I thought, okay, I could definitely stay on task with 10 slides. So essentially, I just go through different decades and try to understand the patterns of gentrification across the, the city's landscape. Right, so this is for each decade. And really focus on what's happening uh, by 2010 and the, the racialization. <clears throat> so I'm not gonna have a lot of time to talk about the empirical evidence, but I will just say, so the primary questions I'm focusing on, how has the character of gentrified neighborhoods changed? How much of the story of gentrification is a story about uh, changing racial composition? And what's the long-term view of gentrification? So the underlying assumption is, we talk, those who would talk critically about gentrification, there's a, an assumption that it just continues into perpetuity, that neighborhoods just become I don't know, uber gentrified and nobody can live there eventually, right? Only, it's only two people, Trump and I don't know his wife. Those are the only people that can afford that neighborhood, right? That's the presumption, I mean, we don't know. We haven't tested how, is there a threshold? Does it stop at some point? So I was trying to get at that. Um, and uh, as Naya warned me, nobody will be able to see your table, Stacey, take it out. And there was a whole conflict around that, but I didn't take it out. But so, so but I, I will um, just describe, so these are just descriptive statistics. So what I do in one part is just looking at 1980, so neighborhoods that gentrified during the 70s, right, and they classified as gentrification, as gentrification in 1980, compared to neighborhoods that gentrified in 2010. Um, and on the right panel, these are the gentrified neighborhoods and that's the rest of the city that never gentrified, excluding upper income neighborhoods that don't qualify for gentrification, right? And the interesting thing, one interesting thing is that in 1980, the racial composition of gentrified and non-gentrified are essentially the same, 51% white, 49% white. Uh, black, 24.9%, 26%. They're not very different. So even early on, we talked that these neighbors are starkly different. We don't see those large differences in terms of income early on. In terms of income, there's a difference between the two, but it's not as, as significant or, or as large as we would expect, and it's not at all significant for blacks and Latinos, meaning blacks were actually making more, their income, median income was higher in non-gentrified areas, right? But when we jump to 2010, we see striking differences. And so that again is, it aligns with the literature in saying something is different in the later period, right? This hyper, this <laughs> hyper gentrification, if you want to, if, if you will. Um, but again, I, I, I begin, this is the beginning table. And so I begin to unpack this uh, even further. This table, which I'm not gonna have a lot of time to describe, is a table that looks at those same neighborhoods that gentrified during the 70s. What do they look like 30 years later, right? Did that hyper gentrification, do they become exclusionary? And so that's column A. And then I compare it to gentrified neighbor, neighborhoods that were newly gentrified in 2010. And then compare that to these, what we call, what I call these exclusionary areas, the upper income areas of New York City that never gentrified. Uh, or, or they may have at some point, but at this point between 2000 and 2010, they are upper income, so they're not gentrifying as a process. They're already exclusionary, right? And so if these neighborhoods start to approach these, then we, are, we can say, yeah, they, they do seem like gentrification over time is moving toward uh, a, a level in which only a few can, can live there. And so when you look at that through a racial lens, what we're seeing is <clears throat> the mature gentrified neighborhoods are whiter than even the hyper, hi, the hyper gentrified. You, can't, you may not be able to read that. That's 43% white in neighborhoods that gentrified in 2010. Those that had 30 years to mature, now they're 49% white, right? And they're only 19% black versus 
22% uh, black, and so on and so forth. And so I'm seeing uh, these, these patterns, and when you compare it to these upper income neighborhoods, there is a, a significant difference between those that gentrify early and uh, the most upper income areas of the city. So that's kind of a hopeful thing. Like, they haven't fully approached the uh, most exclusionary areas. But I'm going to end with this because clearly I, um, you know, tried to pack too much in. So what you see here is all of the tracks that gentrified across the city. This is about 11, um, about 1,000 tracks. There are 2,100 census tracts in New York City. What does that say, one? <laughs> uh, there are 2,100 <laughs> census tracts in New York City. So about half of them, over time, have gentrified. But there's also half a gent of the city that has not had gentrifi gentrification in any period. The reason this is important, and the reason it's important to look at this through the racial ends, yet at what I spend a lot of my research doing in terms of the community economic development. I study neighborhood change, gentrification, and business developments, particularly the, the loss of black-owned businesses, right? If you have half of a city that is gentrified and is moving toward this exclusionary area, and more than 65% of uh, minority-owned businesses are in minority-majority neighborhoods, where are these businesses to locate, right? So, in the book that I'm working on, I, I tell the story of the politics of closure. It's not just about the human capital. It's not just even about the institutional racism that we, I mean, well, it is. It's not about the institutional racism within a banking system, although it, that is a big component. It's also about the spatial contextual factors that are also part of what Dr. Jones is talking about in terms of the system of racism and, and racial inequities. Because the way in which these place-based policies um, uh, the, and seemingly universal policies are deployed, we know they're, they're unequal, right? And that contributes to business closure. And on one hand, it contributes to gentrification, but it also contributes to some of the closures that we're seeing, right? So again, I think this is, you know, in terms of thinking about gentrification, I'm trying to make a case that the class, it's not that it's not a class issue. And a number of scholars have talked about, you know, even uh, kind of the black middle class and gentrification. That's important. But when we try to do it quantitatively and try to control for some of these things that are endogenous, they're, yeah, there's a difficult, you know, the paper's gonna be rejected. I get, I get that, right? But I have to do it anyway because there's a racial claim that needs to be made and there, there are important implications for, I know this is about health, so the important implication for health is just in, in terms of thinking about, um, you know, both the business development and, and, and pride and neighborhood connections and attachment, all of those are part of those social determinants that, that I learned more about today. Um, and I think I'll end there because I think that, yeah, that was the end one. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, okay, hi. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, hope I'm hopefully not gonna do any lobbying right now, though I didn't, didn't read uh, so much in, into those uh, speaker guidelines as I guess I should have. Uh, so thanks for the invitation to be here today. Um, it's been a really interesting and great uh, conference thus far. Um, so the name of this talk is Artifacts of Exclusion. And uh, we're going to start by going for a drive. Uh, and we're in Baltimore now. So um, here we are heading west on, um, on 35th Street. And um, behind me is Waverly, actually where I used to live, where the city is a grid. And uh, ahead of me is Fancy Pants, a neighborhood called Oakenshaw where suddenly the grid stops and where 35th Street becomes something called Southway. Uh, unfortunately for me, trying to visit a friend over there in Fancy Pants, Oakenshaw, uh, I can't get there because the street's blocked with bollards and a curb. So, okay, no problem, I'm gonna make a right and I'll make a left the next chance I get. So here I am heading north. You can chart my progress there on the left. Heading north on Green Mountain Avenue. Uh, so the next chance I can make a left, I'm confronted here uh, not by bollards, but by uh, the curb again, and uh, now there's this big do not enter sign. Okay, let's try again. Okay, now I'm in another fancy pants neighborhood called Guilford. No curb this time, but this time we're confronted with a one-way street sign. Uh, we keep going north. Uh, finally, here we get uh, to North Guilford, and uh, here we find a, a do not enter sign, but also a gate suggesting that maybe this is a private community. Uh, okay, so... You can't read that, but uh, I can't get from Waverly to Guilford, big deal on the one hand, but let's look at this another way. Uh, if we look at what we can't see, namely the demographics, um, we see that this physical divide is also a demographic one. So Oakenshaw is 96% white, 75% of the population has a bachelor's degree, 
$75,000 median income. Waverly is 86% African American, 16% have a bachelor's degree, $40,000 median income. Okay, cultural artifact two, the fence. We're still in Baltimore. We're gonna head east out to the city county line. Uh, and on the border of Baltimore and its suburb of Rosedale sits a 60 acre pile of rubble uh, enclosed by a eight foot tall spiked wrought iron fence. Um, and until 2000, this pile was Hollander Ridge, uh, a 1,000 unit public housing development built in 1976 by the Housing Authority of Baltimore City. It was virtually 100% African American when it was demolished on July 9th, 2000. Uh, and Rosedale was 75% white. So here you can see it. So, so you, see it, you see the fence enclosing what was Hollander Ridge, Rosendale to the north, and you see the dotted line is the city county line. So this fence um, is actually the product of a 1994 HUD pilot project to seek solutions for crime uh, in HUD supported public housing. The recommendation to fence it off was not without controversy. Uh, in a memo to HUD secretary, then HUD secretary Henry Cisneros, the HUD inspector general at the time wrote that, quote, by authorizing such a measure, measure the Baltimore Housing Authority is sending a powerful message that having poor minority people in your neighborhood means crime, drugs, and badly maintained housing, and the best thing to do about it is to put the existing problem people on reservations and keep any additional such persons out. Amen. Nonetheless, in 1998, the Housing Authority constructed this fence at a cost of $1.7 million. Uh, Hollander Ridge was demolished just two years later, so this is a view from Rosedale looking today at that pile of rubble across this fence, which is still this artifact that is out there in the landscape. Cultural artifact three, the shed. Uh, so now we're, gonna, now we're in Detroit, all right? We're, actually, we're on, a, we're on another city suburb line. Uh, it's Alter Road, uh, and it's a border between the city of Detroit and the suburb of Gross Point Park. Uh, so you can't see the demographics here, but Gross Point Park, 93% white, 62% with a bachelor's degree, $97,000 median income, very different demographics for the left side of this drawing, which is the Detroit side. Recently, uh, Gross Point Park has been fortifying its border. They've been fortifying this north-south road, um, coming up with all kinds of clever ways of keeping Detroiters from entering it by car. Uh, so from the top to bottom, uh, you see that there are fences built right in the middle of the street, can't really see this drawing, but there's a fence built right in the, right in the middle of the street. Um, there are snow piles dumped in the middle of the street, so here's a picture of that. So this is, we're, we're in Detroit now trying to get into Gross Point Park, snow just dumped right there. Uh, and then the one I want to focus on is this one in the middle. It's, it's the, the shed or the barn. So this was uh, two summers ago, and this is the view of the shed from Detroit. Um, and this is the view of the shed on the other side from Gross Point Park. And again, it's built right in the middle of the street. So last summer, Gross Point Park, or two summers ago, wanted to build the farmer's market as part of a larger vision of creating a more walkable community that would appeal to young white collar professionals. Sounds fine. Uh, but when they built the farmer's market, they used it uh, to fortify the, the, the town line. Like the snow pile, it's built right in the middle of the street, um, turning Kerchival Street uh, into a dead end. Again, this is what it looks like from the Detroit side. So immediately this was uh, perceived uh, as an attempt to keep, uh, keep out black Detroiters, but the mayor of Gross Point Park disagreed and explained actually that the new market could provide fresh produce to Detroit residents. So like the uh, bollards on Greenmount, the Hollander Ridge fence, this barn is a cultural artifact, uh, a physical manifestation of a deep demographic and social divide uh, so these artifacts are very real, very present reminders that cities exist to bring people together, but cities are also pretty good at keeping people apart. Um, by the way, these also remind us how clever and kind of cheeky those bent on exclusion can be. Um, these are physical markers of institutional racism, right? Um, they're, they're the tools that build a system uh, that enables us to differentiate access to the goods and the opportunities uh, that we have in a society, as it was put before. Uh, so these are a few stories, uh, and these are three stories in a book that is actually 157 different stories um, of exclusion and inclusion uh, in the built environment in the U.S., and it's a book called The Arsenal of Exclusion and Inclusion. Uh, I've been working on it for uh, seven years with my two partners, Georgine and Tobias there, uh, and um, it's an encyclopedia 
of 157 weapons that are used by architects or planners or policymakers or developers, real estate brokers, activists, other urban actors in the United States to wage the ongoing war between NIMBY, not in my backyard, and IMBY, in my backyard. Um, so, uh, uh, so and, and so all these examples come from this book, and so it's a quite a great collection of authors, including Nao Yo. Um, and uh, and uh, so very broadly, uh, so here are some spreads from, it's going to come out in June, this is some spreads. I guess I'm lobbying for the book now, I shouldn't be doing <laughs> that. I, anyway, uh, but uh, so very broadly, the, the, you know, the book looks at exclusion and inclusion in two domains. Housing on the right, that is, who gets to live where, right? And what are the weapons that exclude people from living in this or that community? Um, and exclusion in public space represented on the left by the no loitering sign, that is, who gets to hang out where, right? And what are the different weapons that exclude people from hanging out in this or that space? So an obvious example of an exclusionary housing weapon would be uh, restrictive covenants. So, um, so we all know these, you know, put into deeds for houses, and they defined uh, who could and couldn't live um, in a house used for years, um, declared uh, unenforceable in 1948. Um, so these are legal now, um, thanks to the Fair Housing Act, but not, not all exclusionary weapons are historical, and, and indeed the book uh, spends a lot of time thinking about how people do discrimination now that blatant discrimination is illegal. Uh, so, uh, and indeed, uh, the post-Fair Housing Act era has seen a remarkable proliferation of loopholes and counter policies and practices that effectively neuter uh, anti-discrimination laws with remarkable and remarkably sinister creativity. So we could look to the blood uh, relative ordinance, for example. Some of you might be familiar with this. So when Hurricane Katrina struck New Orleans in uh, 2005, it disproportionately affected uh, the city's low-income rental properties, especially in predominantly African-American neighborhoods. The elimination of roughly 50,000 rentals pushed market rates up by 35%, making housing too expensive uh, for former, many former tenants. St. Bernard Parish, which sits just east of New Orleans' Lower Ninth Ward, did not plan on cooperating with his neighbors to alleviate the shortage. So shortly after Katrina, it passed an ordinance to, quote, maintain the integrity and family atmosphere of its long-established neighborhoods. Under this new law, owners of single-family homes could only rent to blood relatives. Importantly, a whopping 93% of the parish's property owners were white. Uh, so the, the, uh, this was uh, fought successfully. Um, it was de deemed a blatant uh, violation of the Fair Housing Act. But the story did not end there. In 2007, St. Bernard Parish banned the rental of single-family properties in its district just wholesale. The next year, it, impo it imposed a one-year moratorium on all multifamily units. After federal court struck the moratorium down, again for violating the Fair Housing Act, Parish officials countered with a new law requiring a public vote on multifamily dwellings larger than six units. Finally, fed up with the par parish's shenanigans, uh, that HUD uh, threatened to revoke 91 million in federal aid unless it repealed them all, it did. Uh, so I guess there's some good news there. Um, so uh, we could also uh, look, for example, as an example of a kind of post-Fair Housing Act um, um, example of discrimination at, and this doesn't have as much to do with race, although it does a little bit, as what we call the, well, as what has been called an exclusionary amenity uh, term, a term coined by a legal scholar named Lior Jacob Strahalevitz. So the way exclusionary amenities work is like, let's say you want to build a, a city for Catholics. You can't, right, because the Fair Housing Act says that's a, you can't discriminate by religion. So what you do is you make a gated community, you make people pay for the amenities within that community, and then you make those amenities things like churches, things like that are only amenities for certain people and not for others. So it creates this self-selecting mechanism. This is a true example founded by uh, the guy who founded Domino's Pizza. Uh, <laughs> it's in Naples, Florida. It's called Ave Maria. Um, there's lots of examples in the book of other things that function as exclusionary amenities. We found examples of questionnaires that sort of steer the new kind of racial steering, that steer people based on lifestyle preferences to one community or another. Conditions, covenants, and restrictions, these are uh, uh, notoriously classist and racist things that you put into the uh, rules of the homeowners association that say, you know, what color you can and can't paint your house, and it's a way to discriminate by proxy. So this is a collage of everything we could ever find that had ever been um, banned by a homeowners association through CCNRs, overweight dogs, basketball hoops, non-American flags, 
all these kinds of things. You get the idea. So those are some examples of housing discrimination. But what about public space? Um, so uh, so the, w a good example of public uh, space discrimination would, well, actually loitering is a, is a really good one. Um, uh, you know, you might ask, what, what is loitering anyway? Uh, isn't that what we're hanging out is? That's sort of what we're supposed to do in cities. Um, and indeed, woe is the poor bureaucrat whose job it is to write this chapter of the municipal code. So we spend some time in the book actually looking at these codes to try to get to the bottom of what loitering is. It's pretty fun. Uh, it's often poetic. Here's a good one from New Jersey. Loitering means remaining idle in essentially one location and includes the concept of spending time idly. It is to be dilatory, to linger, to stay, to saunter, to delay, to stand around. It shall also include the colloquial expression hanging around. Pure poetry of municipal code. It's amazing. The best one, though, is in New York where they say a person is guilty of, guilty of loitering when he loiters. That's it. <laughs> they don't even, even try, to, try to get to the bottom of it. Uh, uh, so, you know, in the, in the realm of, of, uh, of uh, public space, protesters are victims of the arsenal of exclusion. Of course, we have the right to peacefully assemble, but we also have these things called free speech zones, which uh, corral political protest into zones outside of which protest is presumably uh, illegal. So in the book, we go through, we're, we're, we're architects, so we go through a lot of pains to sort of describe these things spatially and draw them. Um, homeless people, another victim through things like sidewalk sitting bans and court camping ordinances. I'm almost done here. Eating bans, for example. Um, there's more artifacts, like we saw in the beginning, the ubiquitous um, armrest on the bench. Um, and so we spent a lot of time drawing all the different variations that armrests come in. Obviously, these are not put there for your seating comfort, but for the discomfort of someone who might want to get a little too comfortable on them. Um, so um, uh, sprinklers. We found that if water that water the sidewalk, uh, in this case, uh, speakers that blare classical music um, to scare skateboarders away. Actually, because what skateboarder wants to, you know, do ollies to Vivaldi or whatever? Um, ultrasonic noise. Uh, this emits a very high-pitched ear. So teenagers are a big victim of the arsenal. Uh, only only people under 21 can hear this noise because of the way your ear develops over time. Uh, pretty, pretty terrible. I'm told it's pretty terrible. Baggy pants, bands, parental escort policies, all kinds of things. The last thing I want to say is that, is that beachgoers, and the beach is a big frontier in this book. So th we have something called the public trust doctrine, and uh, it says that, you know, you can't really restrict access to beaches. But in the book, we found a lot of examples of how people very cleverly restrict access to the beach through exclusionary tactics. So, um, for example, this is a garage in Malibu. You can see the access, public access to the beach right there. It's in quotes because it's actually not a garage. If you actually go in there, and this is the, you can't really see it to the left, but it's actually a living room. But the, but the person, but the people in Malibu have started building these fake garages so that they could get curb cuts to serve these fake garages so that nobody could park in front of it and have access to the beach. Uh, we see a lot of shenanigans like this. There's similar examples out in Rockaway in New York. These are fire zones, the whole entire street uh, for, for this entire neighborhood, which is, guess what, a wealthy white neighborhood, um, defined as a fire zone. So there's absolutely no parking anywhere. Any, any, so we went, actually went out and mapped this. There's, you can't park anywhere until, of course, you get to the, to the right where there's less white people, and then you can park wherever you want. Um, anyway, uh, lot, lots of examples. We've looked at hockey rinks, for example, as a mean, and, and basketball hoop removal as ways, um, uh, well, he, well here's, here's a quote um, uh, from, from someone who was in support of a local uh, hoop removal ordinance. I used to look out my window at a beautiful park with parents and kids playing soccer. Now since they put, the hoop, since they put out the basketball court, it looks like Rahway Prison Yard. Uh, yes, no racism there at all. Uh, so um, in any case, I'm over time, so I'm going to stop talking, but uh, chock full of exclusion. Yeah. <laughs> So we had a great conversation today um, for the panel talking about housing and foreclosure, talking about gentrification, and also these areas of um, or arsenals of exclusion. I think we need to consider kind of what the presenters are talking about with respect to uh, this idea of how we begin to rethink what community development and economic development is, given the changing demographics of our society.
In addition to thinking about this idea of having and connecting these things with explicit discussions of race, um, health, and also this idea of mixed methodology. So right, there, there's a, a story to tell beyond the numbers. So I'd like to open it up for questions um, from any of the audience members. There's a gentleman in the back. Hi, uh, thank you all for your um, talks. I appreciated them. Uh, this question is for Stacy, but any of you uh, can respond, of course. I'm curious what you see as the implications for a policy discussions mm -hmm. of theorizing gentrification through race. Yeah, thank you for saying that, because of course I didn't get to it. Um, I think there's some interesting examples of policy in terms of, and, and, and other presenters have spoke about kind of the cities in the West Coast, Portland, Seattle, and even Oakland. So Portland has a racial equity, or ha is an e equity plan, right? Their 2012 plan is uh, focuses on racial equity, and there's a chapter in there that's anti-displacement and gentrification. Right, so very explicitly kind of adopted uh, these, this measure. Uh, Seattle was the first to adopt um, a social and racial justice initiative. Right? So it's, it's an initiative within the city government and, and through policy diffusion, uh, Oakland just adopted a, a similar initiative that is funded into perpetuity. It's a small, it's small, right? It's just maybe $500,000, $600,000 but they borrowed the leader from Portland, who learned from Seattle, to build this as an agency and using uh, a set of metrics to look at every city policy through a racial equity lens, right? So the person who presented uh, that health, uh, you know, I forgot what the acronym was, but you can do that, right? And, and I think if we were, and that was the question I wanted to ask hers, how do we apply this to policy? How do we look at every city policy through a lens, and I think if we did that and adopted that people have a right to housing and a right to stay in place, then we would begin to get there. That, that, that's my suggestion, without lobbying. <laughs> <laughs> Are there other questions? Dr. Jones? I keep trying to figure out how we can create ways to burst through bubbles. You know, I, I really think that experiencing our common humanity is necessary for us to even have an interest in, yeah. in dismantling things. So I was especially discouraged by all of those artifacts of exclusion that you documented. And you know what I mean? Like, we know this stuff is going on, and we know the policy barriers are there. And so I just am inviting you guys and anybody here to actually think creatively now about, at the next step, this is just at a personal level, it's not even at a structural or policy level, but how can we create opportunities and the motivation to burst through bubbles as opposed to build up walls? Yeah. Want to take that down? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, uh, that's what we're all trying to figure out, I think, and it's a great question. And, um, you know, I think it, it's, there's, you know, there's, there's a lot of sticks we can think of. Like in some ways, the Fair Housing Act is, a, is that's about breaking through walls, and that's probably our strongest policy tool in some ways. We forget that it's, well, no one in this room forgets, but a lot of people forget that it's not just not discriminating, it's affir affirmatively furthering fair housing. Mm -hmm. And that's a great way to sort of but, uh, break through walls. The problem is it hasn't been um, implemented, and it, it's just the whole history of that legislation has just been people unwilling to enforce it in any way. Hopefully that's changing, right? We're starting to see some sort of movements towards, you know, coming up with new guidelines for what that what affirmatively furthering means and what are some, um, you know, uh, ways to measure that. But that's but still at the end of the day, it's a it's a stick, right? And I think we need we we need we need carrots too, right? We need we need to think of of ways that it's not just about you can't be a jerk, but hey, wouldn't 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 this be a better city? Wouldn't this be a better metro area? If we, if we didn't live in these bubbles, if we didn't have so many walls. And there are a lot of arguments you can make, right, at the regional level about how um, having more fair housing and more you know, opportunity and less walls between you know, rich, poor, black, white, city, suburb, et cetera, um, how that, that would be the, in the best interest of a region. So I, but it's, it's a lot, it, it's, it's harder. And I mean, look at, what, <laughs> look at what's going on in the election. Every time, like, I, get encouraged by like a fair housing ruling. I, you know, you look at what's going on and you, it's like a lot of people who don't see the value in busting down walls and don't want to. And um, it's, it's, I don't know, help, help, something else. 
Um, so I was thinking about two things. Uh, one is uh, when I did this study. Oh yeah, oh, sorry. Sure. Um, when I did the study on gentrification, I was responding to a study that found that not all people who were poor were being displaced, and the um, folks who did that study were absolutely right. Uh, there were lots of people in gentrifying neighborhoods that lived in affordable housing, that lived in public housing, that lived in some form of uh, federal, you know, Section 8 housing. There were all these infrastructure, mutual housing, really creative, interesting things that were out there that made it possible for them to live in those places. Whether or not they're interacting with everybody else who's in there is another question, but at least they were able to stay in these places, which seems to be a first step. The other thing is the foreclosure, and I kind of went through a big deal about that long process, and it did indeed start in some places more so than others, um, but that process of foreclosure has expanded to where it's really experienced by an awful lot of people, and that's um, <laughs> not, not trying to turn this into a good thing. Uh, it is, um, something that's really held in common. And when I've been trying to understand how and why we're in this position, I've been thinking a lot about how we intermediate credit, which is just basically how we go from a borrower um, to where you're putting your deposits in. So it's what happens between an investor uh, and a borrower, or a saver and a borrower, right? You all save money? Right. Not enough people nodded, but, <laughs> right? And then you all borrow money. Um, and so it's a very human thing between the way that these, you know, these two needs for these two different things. If we think about um, all of our common needs to borrow, as well as all of our common needs to save money for our futures, uh, there's a potential intersection there to do this slightly differently. And I think there's a whole bunch more pull to be able to do that differently if we acknowledge that this is a very common thing across all of us. And that foreclosure process now expanding into many other neighborhoods, rather than it being individualized and people feeling very badly about it, right? Ultimately, you sign the paperwork, right? Um, and that's where that anxiety and depression comes in. But if we're able to get past that to think about how we might do that differently, we, we might have something that would really bring us together. I would just add uh, one quick thing that I didn't mention, and that's a piece, a recent piece, and I think it, I don't know if it's fully uh, published, although it's out electronically. Phil Thompson's piece, he, it's, it's, um, he's responding to a book called Place Matters, and and he's arguing that race matters, and he in that piece, it's um, he suggests to fully realize our democracy and, and well-being means achieving equity and rethinking conceptions of race and class, right? And then he goes on to talk for that and says that an appeal, uh, the appeal for a non-racial kind of approach to policy is itself kind of a racial approach, right? I think we have to be more comfortable talking about race. I, I love the way Dr. Jones talked about orange and green. In my class, I talk about black, white, green, and orange, right? Always, like we just have to be comfortable talking, we're all racial bodies and, and recognizing how these disparities kind of manifest and, and then be comfortable, you know, this, I mean, I think Phil's thing is that we, we have to also be comfortable with this idea of redistribution, right? And that's where people, <laughs> you know, but be talking about race and redistribution, the R and R's, it, it's, it's challenging uh, to say the least, you know. Yeah, I think, do, do we have enough time for one more question? One more question, sir. Sure. Um, I'm Andrew K. Sandoval Strauss, University of New Mexico and Princeton University. Terrific panel. Uh, one of the big trends in America, of course, is the Latinization of many cities. Uh, does the presence of millions and millions of Latinos change the way you think about your subjects? And if so, how? Good question. Um, I can just say, n not necessarily, in the sense that, so I, I, I use the four dominant race groups, you know, and black, white, and I put um, Latin. Latinos as a racial group of no ethnicity. Um, it's interesting. I think it complicates things, surely. Uh, and moving to Chicago now, in uh, you know, uh, from New York and now living in Chicago, which is a, a, a city of confinement, right? Black, white, Latino, 30, 30, 30 percent, and then 10 percent other. It's what I find really striking is how Latinos identify, right? In terms of how they situate with different groups and how we build coalitions. Um, and you know, and the, the, the upset in, in, in Chicago over the mayoral election was fundamentally a, a tension between blacks and Latinos, right? Um, and I think if we could find more spaces for solidarity, it, 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 it wouldn't just complicate uh, gentrification in Chicago, it would change everything. That would be 60% of the population, right? Um, so it's, it's really complicated in terms of who aligns with whom and when and what issues. Uh, so I, I 
hate to think that I walk around talking about methods all the time. Um, <laughs> we're doing a food assessment in New Brunswick, and more than half the population is uh, Latino, and I don't speak Spanish, um, just in interest of full disclosure. And so my research methods, I run into a giant wall. Um, and just practically speaking, this is a tremendous problem, and I realize it's incredibly obvious, but it's also incredibly common. And so I can't understand what's going on in neighborhoods if I don't speak the language. Um, and it becomes that much more difficult to be able to do that, and we do it in partnership with other people, but um, it's no good excuse. I know there are a whole bunch of people sitting here going, oh my gosh, enough already, go learn Spanish. Uh, but I think that that's, I mean, it's, it's a very, well, no, I'm, I'm doing it with some people who are here thinking, go learn Spanish. Uh, it's a very common issue. I mean, it sounds crazy, right? But if we think about the diversity of a city like Patterson and all the languages that are spoken, an ability to do community planning, an ability to understand neighborhoods, an ability to go and know what's going on in all these communities. The only way to do it is to be able to communicate with all the folks who are there. Um, the census data is wonderful, and all those things provide some idea, way of understanding it, but without being able to communicate, um, I find it very difficult to really, really understand that community and those people and their problems, which is why I'm talking to them. I, I just add that. Uh, I love Hispanics, they make great taco bowls. <laughs> <laughs> Donald Trump joke. If you <laughs> yeah, we got it. I think we'll end right there. So, <laughs> I'd like to, um, for you all to give the panelists another round of applause. Um, and encourage you to follow up with them if you have any other questions.